Is there any message you're trying to get across with anything that you guys are doing? Uh, the message is the awakeness itself. You know, it's, uh, to do something like this and stay awake is no easy task. Welcome to the workshop. I'm Nancy and I'll be your guide. The mandalas you just saw were made from watercolor in the workshop which follows. Very soon now you'll be making your own. I'd like to tell you about it. I call this way of working mandala meditation because the mandala, simply put, is a circular design radiating out from source or center. It reflects our hidden wholeness our natural perfection. From its center comes strength and well-being. Like a flower, the mandala unfolds from the center into the light. We too grow by opening. Throughout the ages, in many cultures, the mandala has been created in painting, stone, textiles, and many other art forms. Mandala mirrors our life and the natural order. Mandala is the relationship between ourself and the universe, between the still center and continual change. For each one of us, the mandala will be different. I use the word meditation because we'll look inside ourselves to discover parts of our life which are looking for healing. When we allow ourselves to be open to the images which emerge, a vast reservoir of healing energy is available. It is this energy we want to channel. This energy has profound impact on our physical and mental processes. This will be an art experience, but I promise you that no previous art experience is necessary. This is a workshop for all of us who want to better understand ourselves and heal ourselves. What we do in mandala meditation is to reflect on our life as we see it now and we'll let four areas come to our attention where we'd like to see some healing or some change or some growth. Our reflection must be without any judgment as to good or bad. We want simply to be present to our life as it is. These areas may be as specific as physical or emotional pain, an attitude or belief that we would like to change, something about our job or career or our spiritual state 
or a particular relationship or something in the world situation. We have the whole range of human experience to draw from. We'll use a basic circle drawing, the mandala, and it will look like this. And we'll need the following supplies. We'll work first with the part of our life most calling for our attention and we'll visualize the way that particular situation or condition looks and feels as it is now. This is a very important step, seeing and accepting what is. We'll put this image into our mandala in an outer portion of one of the four quadrants. Next, we'll image this same condition healed or changed or in its process of growth and we'll put this image into the inner portion of the same quadrant. We'll continue around our circle until we've worked in all four quadrants. Now let me mention the center of your mandala. The center represents the source of life. It may be a religious symbol for you possibly a rainbow, tree or flower, or a design of your choosing, or maybe a void, a blank, whatever feels right. You may fill in the center of your mandala whenever you wish. As we meditate on the center of our mandala, we are drawing on vital energy to transform our physical, emotional, mental and spiritual processes. We are inviting healing. We have connected our energy to universal source energy, and we can trust this connection. Before we actually begin, we'll have a quieting meditation so that you'll feel ready to reflect on your own life situations and find your own mandala images. I invite you now to relax and to quiet your breathing by letting your breath become slower and deeper and more regular. Slower and deeper and more regular. Let your conscious thoughts drop away. You won't need them now. Let your thoughts drop away so that your own images can begin to come. We want to be open and receptive to our life as we're feeling it now without any judgment as to good or bad, right or wrong. Whatever is there for us, whatever is calling our attention for healing or for change or for growth, will come to us in the form of pictures or sounds or body sensations. These are the messages for our personal self-healing mandala these are the images which we'll transfer to our mandala in whatever way suits us. It's important that we stay in our quiet place as long as necessary. We don't want to think about our life with preconceived ideas or images. What we want is to be open to our life, to let it speak to us. And we want to return to our quiet place as often as necessary in this way of working. Whenever we want to receive images, all we need to do is quiet our breathing and let our conscious thoughts drop away. Stay with your breathing now, slower and deeper. Allow your life to speak to you and allow four areas in particular to come to your attention for healing or for change. Perhaps just one is wanting to come to you at this time. The others will come later on and that is fine. We want to be open and gentle and non-judgmental about what comes to us. When the music stops, 
very gradually come back to your waking consciousness and enjoy a demonstration by Rose Birch in Mandala Meditation, The Watercolor Way. The choice of using watercolor as a medium in developing a mandala image requires that you make even more choices. Which brush? What colors? Relax. Choose what feels best. We begin to apply the water either as a whole circle or within quadrants representing the areas of life you would desire to develop, change, or heal. The character and style of brush and color you choose are as important to the process as the strokes and way in which you apply the pigment. The water has a wonderful part in the process. It has a life of its own. It acts as a courier. The water relieves you from having to prepare thought out or premeditated images. You need not be an accomplished artist. The water as a lively river or as a still, quiet pond carries or settles the color into patterns and images representing your inner being, its conflicts, beauty, and growth. We need not be afraid as the color flows seemingly out of control even into another quadrant. That's the way life is. Areas overlap. Sometimes the limits you have drawn to define the quadrants of your life seem restrictive or the total image may feel incomplete. Feel free to add to the outer space as well as to the inner. As the colors and images expand, mingle and grow into visual concepts, you will not only have the opportunity to feel changes, but you will grasp visually the process and path through which the changes may take place. Remember that the images formed are alive with your life. It may want to grow even after this workshop. Or others may want to be born. touching areas of your life 
such as your spiritual growth, relationships, physical well-being, and work. Well, this is the first time that I've done the watercolor mandala. I've been living on the island of Hawaii these past three years, and I was surprised in the mandalas I've done today that lava came into, um, into all of them. And I just could feel the lava, you know, growing underground. I wanted to get that swell, you know, and, um, and then have the little sparks infiltrate everything, little, little fire-like things. <laughs> Um, what emerged doesn't exactly look particularly <laughs> glowy and sparkly, but, but this outer part is meant to really actually be underneath with, um, with the flame and the, the lava, the molten lava. Um, and then the center is, is that too, the healing of, of the lava coming and infiltrating all aspects of life. This quadrant right here represents my work, which right now is being held somewhat at bay. It's very quiet, and um, this is my work work with my patients in the office, and it's not taking a very primary place. Um, my real work is about healing a number of different people and things in my life, and I've had to do a great deal of nurturing and 
nursing over the last year and that seemed to come right out of this quadrant and expand the purple being for me very much the healing energy and um, but very diffuse going out in many many directions feels like there's a great deal to heal right now and this last quadrant right here almost um, looking like uh, small buds or flowers that haven't opened. It felt like that, it felt like closed, but these are the relationships, the primary relationships in my life, and they're also at, not totally held at bay, but just at a very quiet uh, time. I have most of my energy going very much up into this quadrant for healing. This one, I could hold it any way, and this way it looks, has for me the feel of right here as a, as a brain stem. And if I hold it this way, it feels somewhat like a, like a fetus. So it's as if it's, it's the center part, this consciousness now taking form in one of these little bits and pieces and parts. And this is, this is the uh, sort of the beginning on the one hand and the, and the, the emergence of, of, the, of the human being on the other. And it both comes from and it returns to uh, consciousness itself. And these are all part of the journey, part of the journey that we go through uh, as human beings. For me, this, this one represents potentiality. This is sort of a, a fire. Uh, it could be anger, it could be the, the emotions. It's, it's, it's that which gives energy and, and power uh, to life. This is potentiality here. Uh, and this is uh, my friend, the snake, the serpent. Uh, and that's energy rising, and uh, I felt rather friendly toward him today. Don't always feel that way, but today we felt friend on friendly terms. Then I went over here and asked this quadrant what, what it was, and what that is, is um, my risk taking. <laughs> I've, I've gotten real playful, did a lot of things that I've never done before, and I really feel like that's a big place for me, just opening up and just, I got incredibly playful over here and just started feeling ticklish inside. Um, and all the greenness around here is little sprigs of growth, just little dotted. And I saw my own playful image right in here. This was uh, one of the first ones I did, and as I worked, it seemed like I could see the face of the man and the moon in it. My final one was so different. And even several people commented on how dark this one is. And I realized that uh, in comparison with this lighter one, I was focusing on specific issues in my life. And yet my life is not this dark right now, although it is in a time of transition. I just celebrated my 25th wedding anniversary last week. And one of the few difficult issues in my marriage is the fact that it feels like the dark side of the moon is not acceptable to my husband. That as long as I'm cheerful, bright, alert, kind, friendly, he can support me and love me. But whenever I experience or express pain, fear, anger, um, disillusionment, or whatever, uh, the support is totally withdrawn. And he literally just sort of fades away. It's like I'm all alone. And so this was an opportunity for me to really look at the dark side of the moon and in a way to celebrate it. This doesn't scare me. This doesn't feel like a threatening Mandela or a bad Mandela at all. It seems to have a lot of energy in it, a lot of life in it, a lot of color in it. And I like it as much as the front side of the moon. The work here today has just kind of developed in an exciting way. And you can find yourself just being engrossed in it and seeing how that it's going to reach out and grow some more and touch somebody. And it's like whenever a viewer looks at your work, it's like that piece grows even more. And there's something exciting about that because you know that that piece is alive. The water is only a starting point. It's like the vision continues after that and the growth.
A few words as we bring the workshop to a close. You have touched your lives with new understandings and healing energy. In many cases, you have given yourselves new directions, new blessings, new opportunities, not just for today, but for every day. I suggest that you place your completed mandala in some prominent place where you can interact with it frequently, and that daily you pause to give thanks for the changes that are already taking place, holding the image of your desire, feeling it already present. These positive affirmations will remind you that you are taking charge of your life. We know that the early Polynesians entered mysterious realms to create their own reality. Author-artist Kristen Zambucca has gifted us with a beautiful interpretation of this positive lifestyle in her book, Ano Ano, The Seed. And we also know that modern scientific data supports the power of the mind to create reality. For example, the pioneer research available through the work of Stephanie and Carl Simonton, specifically their meditation visualization work with terminal cancer patients. I hope you will enjoy your mandala as your very own creation. As we experience healing, we also awaken our creative potential. The artist within is born, and the artwork of creating our own lives can begin. I'd love to know how it goes for you. Aloha and all blessings. and most spectacular sea cliffs in the world. It's an area so remote and rugged that it's accessible only by boat or helicopter and only when weather permits or by an exhausting 11-hour hike. Eight years ago, Joyce Kainoa moved her family to this area, Ono Kaupu Pelekunu. There are many things that I have accomplished with my children and I cry and I cry for good reason because I wish that I could open my home I take on all the kids and bring them in here and feel some proud being proud of what they have. to bring my children in here and give them alternative skills. I wanted to teach my kids how to live off the land and on the land and with the land. Same goes for the ocean. The setting is perfect. This is nature. I, I really want to be in harmony with nature. And I felt that if I wanted to make it work, I had to sit down and talk story with my kids. And that is what I did. And I had to ask them because I felt it was 
very important that fairness be extended to them. It's not like I, the mother, make the decision and we just move in here because I said so. I need cooperation. And we came in here and we, and we looked at the place and we said this would be a great place to live. And um, we went upstairs to go look where we was going to build our house and it was all overgrown, all grass, and it took us a very long time to cut all the grass down. Then I remember that we was, um, first time we got up to the top, we saw deer and we saw pigs running around, and we all was in the grass trying to get the pig, and we couldn't. So we, we cut the grass slowly by slowly, and we got it done. It took us a long time. What you're sitting in is eight years of work, you know? I mean, we, we, my kids and I, with Mike's help, we cleaned this land in six, I would say approximately seven months. It's always nice up here. This land and how I got it, you know, I, all I do is I gotta thank God. So what I did was go into the tax office and I believe they don't squat on people's land. You just don't move on and live just because nobody is around. And so I walked into the tax office, found this piece of property. There was, just happened to be this point, you know, overlooking the bay. And the, the couple, they come from Maui. I wrote to them and asked them if they would lease out this land. Um, they wrote back, and their response to that letter was that they weren't going to lease for five years. They were going to give the land to me. And I love this couple today. They have, they have same philosophies. One of the main reasons for her coming over here and for one of the main reasons for me, you know, is, that, is, an, is to give the skill, uh, kids the skills and the opportunity to have the knowledge and the experience to support themselves. They know how to, to uh, hunt and fish and garden and work. Well, you know, it's like, let me put it this way. The ocean is our icebox. The mountain is our icebox. And I cherish and I value that I myself do not abuse by getting greedy, taking more than what I need, because I don't. I don't need enough to take care of today and tomorrow. I just take care of what I can do for today. So I tell my kids, you gotta respect what nature has provided. And you, the caretaker, must make sure that there is always some for tomorrow, and the next day, and the next day. She always says that don't leave bait there laying on the stones unless you're laying it for a reason. And the other one is when you catch a fish or else when you catch a fish and you don't like that kind of fish, don't, don't kill it. You know, just take out the hook as, as nice as you can and just throw it back in the water. But if it's dead, then you should eat it. Don't waste no fish. Whatever you catch, you eat. If I want to go and tell them, okay, let's go figure out what the fish eat today. And we all have fishes in Hawaiian names. I don't go show them the fish. First, I take them to the feeding grounds, what they eat. You know, if you can figure out what the fish eat, where the feeding grounds, you don't have to go chase too much fish. You go where they eat. You know, you go to the ice box. What is important today may not be important tomorrow. No, what is important today will always be important for every day that they live. You, you expand it to the end of life. And this is, this is a task to ask anyone. You're like how I ask my kids you know, how to take care of the tar patch. How we could take them to the ocean when I take them diving, in school in the ocean. When they tell them they cannot fish twice in the same place. Why ban them from, from overfishing an area? Because they're kids. Why set certain rules because I have to impose them? There's no game wardens here. There's no uh, law enforcement officers within the closest, what, 20 miles on the North Shores. But I gotta apply that kind of ruling because other than that, we ourselves can abuse it. If they keep on taking and taking and not putting back, the ground's gonna die. And I've seen it statewide. No, 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 Boca. I travel a lot. Um, political reasons too. Because I don't stay home. I go to the legislature. I lobby on particular bills. I lobby on fishing bills. You have a responsibility to take care of the social problems 
That includes the legal problem too. Because if we don't have it, you're gonna have a riot on yourself. You're gonna have a riot right down here, on Molokai, on the big island, on Maui, on Kauai. Because the pe poor people do not have, or the people in general, do not have the access to take care of their pilikia, their trouble. Now we don't wanna live like this, and nobody should live like this. We shouldn't be put under this pressure. We shouldn't be put in a position where we gotta come down here and we gotta practically beg, beg for our money. Think about the people. Because without the people, you guys are not gonna be in office. Thank you. I cannot sit back here and watch things happen that I know are gonna be detrimental to the environment. And even though an expert may challenge me, I don't mind saying it out loud, that this awareness, generating awareness becomes very important to me about people finding out, you better take a second look at what you're doing, because down the road, there may be nothing for the unborn. And that keeps me going out, because my kids gotta go out there and live someday. I don't expect them to completely lock themselves in here. I expect them to go outside to civilization and try to fit themselves in not adopt, fit themselves in, and see how they like it. You know, I agree with what she does in, in, politically and, and, and as far as the community goes, as far as our concerns for Molokai. And, and I feel good knowing that, that she could not uh, attend to those things if I didn't take care of our home and, and teach the boys and try and take care of things around here so that she wouldn't have to worry about her kids and wouldn't have to worry about her home. So I feel like I'm right there, you know, helping. It's like a church. This whole place is like a church. And I'm always thankful. I don't have to go into the building and pray. You know, if I'm feeling good inside myself, I thank God straight up. I don't have to, there's nothing blocking. That was kind of neat when I saw Kelvin coming up here and down and he was looking in another hole and he's coming up and then all I saw was this big black spot coming out. You know, I knew the next thing Kelvin shot it with his parent coming up and then he got off. Then I went down and he got it for him. That was good fun. Um, let's see, my favorite chore is just to ignore, ignore the jobs and go downstairs and go dive. You begin in your household. You begin with your immediate family. And this, in this case, is my children. And I gotta be as fair as possible in trying to resolve personal differences, arguments between the boys or myself and them, or we disagree about something. I came from that family background. This new habit you got, looking on the floor. Huh? Don't look on the floor. You like talk to somebody, Kibo. Put up your hand and talk. What happens when we don't talk to each other? You can avoid many fights, many disagreements. We sit down and talk. If not, you can go out and go out like this, like a walking time bomb, until you explode, then what? Is somebody gonna get hurt? You, you think somebody gonna come inside here and fix our problems? Nobody's busy. We're going to fix our own. So you learn how to do it. I don't like you take advantage. I don't want Bob to take advantage, especially if you know about how we think. Because I'm going to turn around, I can take advantage too if I wanted to. I try and keep things together over here, and I try and be nice to you guys. Sometimes uh, you guys don't want to be nice in return. And I don't know why, I can only guess. And, and when I guess, the thing that I guess is that you guys figure in your mind that if, if you're nice to me, you're going to end up with more job. And it seems like if you give me a hard time, then I'm not going to ask you to do anything. So I end up saying, ah, oh, forget it, I'm not going to bother with the kids. 
<coughs> that's not fair to me, it's not fair to you, it's not fair to us yeah. around here, all of it. Bobby, it's good for you to pay attention to this. Okay, now, you guys chew us up. You guys turn. You know, this morning I have the problems. You got any bad feelings about what, mommy? No, nope. about you, Kimo? Did mommy make you work too hard? Grumble too much? Nothing. Nothing. So it must be I'm all right there, yeah? You sure now? Or you got a complaint? Not right now. Not right now. So I'm on hold. Okay. Did you brush your teeth and wash your face this morning? Mm -hmm. Okay. You're tired. I'm finished. I come out a very humbling experience about us and nature and nobody around. We get hurt, we gotta pack somebody out. So, you know, we try to be careful with our kids, even if I walk, walking by myself. Look at the difference. Turn around, on the back. Can you tell me what the difference? This one more uh, Feel them in your hand, feel them. This one more smooth and this one more Yeah, that one's sour. Really keep their leaf, you so you get good with your eyes. We hike a lot, even when we're hunting. I even can introduce, oh, there's one plant over there, you kids should look at them, you know, and what it's used for. So it's a combination of different things happening all at one time. And it makes it easier because it's not like it's planned all the time, it's that it's unexpected, it happens. My children don't have to look at it in the book. It's right in their yard. And I can take them up to them and explain to them, this is how the old folks did it, the people of old. This sort of lifestyle is an alternative. And it's also, to me personally, it means identity. That my ancestors, or the people of old, the Hawaiian people, had great respect for nature for land custodianship, for ocean custodianship. My kids need to be exposed to that kind of nurturing, caring. I send my kids down the switchback, down the trail, down to the ocean. And they become little ambassadors, you know, I put titles on them. And I tell him, he says, well, go out there, swim out, go talk to the captain. Ask the captain if you can come aboard. Or would you like to come up here and visit with us and talk story? Sometimes, well, our son, our youngest son, comes over here and spends a week or two every summer and tries to come maybe once during the winter. And then their kids come out and stay with us in town and go to the movies and look for girls and <laughs> have a nice time. I think that they really look forward to McDonald's, you know. <laughs> when Bobby came to Honolulu, that's all he wanted to do was look for chicks. Look for chicks. Where are the chicks? Do any chicks live near you? <laughs> when do we get to go see the chicks? Uh huh. Uh huh. Are there will there be any chicks at the movie? I asked him, do you want to go to the swap meet? And he said, oh, I don't know, what is that? And so I started telling him, he said, and uh, he said, well, I don't know if I want to go. I said, well, there'll be a lot of chicks there. And so he went and he had a wonderful time. <laughs> oh, absolutely, absolutely, wherever the chicks are, huh? Man, the chicks are bad, yeah, Bob. John, John, it was here. That's better than thinking about boys. <laughs>
I hope to at least stress character points. You know, how to, how to get along with people, how to eliminate the color, the race. All the multinationalities that we've come across, people who hiked in, sailed in, and all kinds of ways to get in here. I saw that Ivy League jerk chasing her over the dance floor. I called the police. Don't I didn't want, want my kids to be stuck to the TV. So we didn't get any TV. I didn't get no TV. And then one day, outside in Kanakakai Town, a very good friend of ours came up and told me, you got any TV home, Joyce? And he said, no. It was his tone of voice that made me stop. Normally, I got a wall up, you know, a shield, and I'm on alert. You never know what, what's going to be said to me. And I said, oh, no, uncle. I don't have a TV, you don't need TV. He says, you know, you're depriving your children of entertainment. And because I valued what he said, I thought about it a lot, entertainment. You know, that word is a big word. And I looked at my home and how we progressed in five years and felt that maybe it was time that my children deserve this particular entertainment, a television. When it rains, we get more water, and we get more water coming down in the pipe, and it pushes the wheel much faster, and we get more electricity, and it lasts longer, and get more better TV reception. Um, the way we get our electric thing is that we have a, um, a river that's a quarter mile away, and we have a four inch PVC pipe that goes up to the river, and we get about a two inch water flow that comes down in our white pipe, and it comes through this valve right here. That uh, water wheel, I only need to run 12 hours a day. Uh, I shut it off in the morning and turn it on in the evening. And it provides all the electricity we need. Over the eight years that we've been here, there's been a lot of the, those years that we didn't have electricity in any form at all. When I was 15, I went to uh, through the Marquesas and French Polynesia on a 96-foot schooner. And uh, I saw that there was another way to live, and I decided when I was 15 that that's the way I was going to live. And uh, it turned into being a combination of the old and the new. You know, Western ways and Hawaiian ways is what you see here. I can understand if people question, you know, how we are able to stay in here, because I run into that all the time. We are about 65% self-sufficient. And what I mean is that we grow all of our vegetables. We grow our taro. And that is a supplement in case there's no rice. Fishing, hunting is part of my lifestyle. So Hawaiians like me, you know, live like off the land, the makomakai concept. No excuse for stop. Okay. It doesn't take money for living in a place like this. If I really need extra money, I just have to go back and go get my commercial license and go back fishing. We got to deal with our, our personalities. And, I, and I, go, I give you an example in winter when it rains a lot. When it rains a lot, then we have to create things in the house under the roof because it's raining, so you can't work out in the yard, right? Well, for us, we start making nets putting on floaters, putting our nets together for summer fishing. This winter, it's closed off for us. I get school, I got more school. Uh, we read a lot, we get into our books. And I'm their tutor. I try and teach them the, the, what I consider a basic education. And they all have to uh, take the GED in order to graduate from high school. Bobby is, uh, he knows all the math now that for the three-dimensional math for laying out, designing a boat. And he does that on his own now. I feel good about it. Kimo is, uh, is a wonderful person. He's, he has never been in public schools. Uh, we've yet to see if this is uh, going to hurt him. I don't believe so. He gets along with people great, you know, and, and uh, he pursues knowledge. We have fishing skills and hunting skills and building skills and, you know, social skills that I think because we are isolated gives us more of a chance to get close to the kids. You know, they, 
outside there's so much distractions. They've always had the choice to uh, live outside. And so far, uh, our girl, when she was uh, in the uh, 10th grade, uh, decided that she wanted to live outside, which was good. Uh, so far, uh, the boys haven't, uh, you know, exercised their option. Their mother knows that for their for their good, that as if they were raised completely Hawaiian, speaking Hawaiian, only doing Hawaiian things, that they would be lost as adults because, you know, when kids get to be 15, when they go, you know, start entering uh, young adulthood, there there's a, you know, universal uh, desire to kihele. You know, they're going, and and that's to be expected. It's that when you get older, when you go outside, if I stayed in here without seeing the outside world, then I would like, I would only know where I live. Then if I go out there and I see half of that and half of here, then if half of your side wants to go live out there and half you want to stay back here. You know what I mean? I oh, one of my kids. But you know, that's all I can do, hope. One of my kids would come back here, whether they actually live here for, you know, right through the year. I only can pray somebody does out of my six children. Um, I hope that my kids would always plant taro, you know, let use the water. I hope that my kids would care for the land the way I care for the land. I hope my kids will keep on inviting people coming up here. I feel that it's important that a lot of Hawaiians, first off, be proud of what they are, no matter what anybody tells them. They come from a very, very culture that makes Hawaii what it is today. A lot of times I'm sensitive because too many things are happening outside, and a lot of Hawaiians cannot cope with a dual culture, like I'm adjusting to. I feel that we lost touch with a lot of our lands because it got ripped off, got adverse possessed. Uh, we call it legal stealing. I feel about our natural environment, how, how people are very abusive and cruel with each other on land. They can be cruel in the ocean too. I feel a lot of times that our young people, a lot of our Hawaiian kids are juveniles. I look at a lot of Hawaiians in prison. I try to figure out why are they there? Why so many of my own people in prison? Why so many of our Hawaiian kids cannot cope with the public schools? Why they turn and fight against it? Why they cannot live in harmony? There are many things that I have accomplished with my children, and I cry, and I cry for good reason, because I wish that I could open my home and take on all the kids and bring them in here and feel some proud, being proud of what they have. A lot of Hawaiians cannot do this because they don't have no land. And when you lose touch with the land, you lose touch with the roots. So you're not proud anymore because you listen too long to another culture telling you you ain't you're good for nothing, you're lazy, you're drunk, you beat up your guys' wives. Well, nobody is gonna tell me that today because I'm what I am, because I've gone through a lot where I cry because I'm proud. I'm proud that I've overcome that barrier because I live a dual culture. I take the benefits from the Haole culture, and I take the benefits from the Hawaiian culture, and I apply it here. I could never I think in real, being realistic, go back and practice the ancient Hawaiian ways. I couldn't cope with it because it wouldn't be fair to me or fair to my kids because I would have to reflect that. I feel that my children will always have to adjust to another culture and I give them the Hawaiian culture first as much as I can and as much as I've learned. <laughs> 